zu sagen. All right, so just give another minute here just to, um, I don't know if there's gonna be more people logging on. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly um, do some housekeeping first before I do the introduction. I, I noticed that everyone so far has themselves muted. We're all Zoom experts already. Um, so if you can keep yourselves muted until the end of the um, program, we would appreciate that. And you can have questions at the end, just so that um, you know we're able to get through the whole entire presentation first. And there may be questions that are answered throughout the presentation. Um, if you know, as Dr. Maletsky does his program. If you want, you can also send a message in the chat. Um, if you, you know, if there's something burning and you're afraid that you're not gonna be able to remember it. So I wanna welcome everyone to today's program, the history of Juneteenth with Dr. Maletsky. I am Laura McKinley from the Huntington Public Library. Um, I'm hosting this program on behalf of the public libraries in the township of Huntington. We're joined today by patrons from seven of our area libraries, which is Cold Spring Harbor, Comac, Half Hollow Hills Community Library, Harborfields Public Library, Huntington Library, Northport, Northport East Northport, and South Huntington Public Library. Um, I just want to make a note here that Dr. Maletsky is an associate professor in the Department of Africana Studies um, and History at the University of Stony Brook. Um, he specializes in recent African American history, civil rights, Black power, urban history, mixed race, biracial identity, and hip hop studies. I'd like to welcome him today, and we are very excited about your presentation, Dr. Maletsky. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate you. Um, Appreciate uh, everybody coming on, and uh, I'm sure that as the uh, time goes, there'll probably be more folks coming on. Um, I want to thank the Huntington Public Library first and foremost, and just uh, thank all the other um, joining libraries that uh, that jumped in and got involved. Um, we appreciate that, and um, I'm very uh, excited to be here tonight, and uh, feel privileged to do so. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great topic and one that uh, I'm very eager to share. Um, and so I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, because I did prepare some slides uh, that, you know, sort of help us, I think, to understand uh, the history just uh, a little bit better um, uh, rather than just uh, hearing about it. And so uh, what an interesting holiday Juneteenth is. Uh, Juneteenth has this amazing history behind it and actually is a holiday that can only really be understood by understanding that American history and that, that history that, that's sort of behind it. I is probably be hard pressed to think of another uh, sort of holiday uh, that had uh, this much complexity, uh, in fact. And so a lot of people have been asking, you know, what is Juneteenth? Um, you know, how do we celebrate it? What is it about? How did it come about to be? What is the word? Where does the word come from? Um, and I think a lot of people are just asking questions and so and are curious. And so that's what we hope to do today to try to uh, talk about the history a little bit uh, uh, with you. Um, of course, the issue uh, 
at the heart of this is the issue of slavery. Um, you, you, if you, you know, at the very outset, uh, that uh, Juneteenth is a, a holiday celebrating emancipation. Emancipation of whom? Emancipation when and why is the is the other part is of the question. Uh, but this makes this holiday very unique because there really is no other holiday that commemorates, uh, not really one that we nationally celebrate, commemorates the uh, excuse me the end of slavery, or even really acknowledges that slavery even happened if you really stop and think about it. Um, there's Martin Luther King Day, and even that, a lot of folks have said, well, we've moved away from well, what Martin Luther King's values were about, and stuff like that. And so part of that is what happens when something like this becomes a holiday, uh, uh, how we celebrate it, how we talk about it, and all those other things. But at the heart of this is uh, uh, the story of our national shame as a country, which is slavery. Uh, it happened. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about. Uh, as it relates to Juneteenth in particular, let me start at the beginning and at the and also sort of at the end, because Juneteenth is the the last emancipation, the final emancipation of the final few of those who were held in bondage, held in bondage in Galveston, Texas. Um, now, right off the bat, a lot of you can, we can rely on our knowledge of American history. Uh, the Civil War ended, well, let me back up even further. The Emancipation Proclamation was passed January 1st, 1863. The 13th Amendment, which is said to have ended slavery, was not ratified until December of 1865, actually after Juneteenth. But what we do know is that the Civil War ended at the Appomattox Courthouse in April of 1865. And yet there were people who were still enslaved in June of 1865, April, May, June, some three months where you still have people who were being illegally enslaved in Texas. And I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, it was with the arrival of Union troops in Galveston, Texas, under the command of Major General Gordon Granger on June 19th, 1865. Let's just start with the facts that slavery ended in America, not with the Emancipation Proclamation, well after that, not necessarily with the 13th Amendment, which has its other issues, which we'll talk about, uh, and was still not even ratified yet. It's a simple timeline. We're still in the process of being ratified. You know, a, a constitutional amendment has to be ratified by every uh, by enough states in order to pass. But with the arrival of Union troops, some of whom were black, literally had to liberate those who were being held in bondage in Galveston, Texas, by bayonet point. Union troops came to liberate them. Dating back to 1865, it was on June 19th that those soldiers led by Gordon Granger landed at Galveston, Texas, not just with the news that the war had ended, because that's one of the myths of Juneteenth that we hear a lot, that, hey, they just didn't get the word in time. Uh, something happened to the Pony Express or a uh, messenger didn't make it. I've heard all of those things uh, said that, you know, that the messenger, a messenger was killed along the way. Uh, it's not just that with the news that the war had ended and that the enslaved were now free, but literally to liberate enslaved people that Texas was still holding in bondage in violation of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, I want to stop for a moment because a lot of times people mention, you know, there was problems with the Emancipation Proclamation as, as well. It didn't free that many people as one might think. But these are people who it did free. In Galveston, Texas, the Emancipation Proclamation kicked in precisely because if you read it, it was written that any state in rebellion to the Union, if the Civil War ended in April of 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse, then people who were holding slaves in Texas by June of 1865 were thenceforth and definitely in rebellion to the United States and to the Union, if you take my meaning. I'm going to come back to all of this. Um, 
Note that this was two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Indeed, President Lincoln himself had already been assassinated. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, as I said, had little impact previous on the Texans due to the minimal number of Union troops to enforce the new executive order. Remember that the Emancipation Proclamation was a military order. It was a military strategy, in fact, that Abraham Lincoln used to turn the tide of the Civil War. It was an, actually an ingenious military strategy in that sense, because what it did was it only applied to states that were in rebellion to the Union, which is known as the Confederacy, Confederate States of America, the states that had withdrawn and seceded. And so people said, well, why, write, uh, why free the slaves only in the places uh, that were in rebellion to the Union? Um, because this is where things get complicated. There were states like Tennessee and Maryland, what we call the border states, where Lincoln had the authority, he had the legal jurisdiction to free those slaves, and he does not do that. He only frees the slaves in the states that had seceded from the Union. And it was a brilliant military strategy because the enslaved literally put down what they were doing, heard the emancipation as the word spread, because that part is true, the word had to spread, and in many cases reported to Union Army lines. How can I sign up? How can I help? And they liberated themselves. It turned the course of the Civil War. Um, but again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, with the surrender of General Lee in April of 1865 and the arrival of General Granger's regiment, the forces were finally strong enough to influence and overcome the resistance. This had to be backed up by military. That's the key part to understand about Juneteenth. Uh, Later attempts to explain this two and a half year delay in the receipt of this important news have yielded several versions that have been handed down through the years. Often told as the story of a messenger who was murdered on his way uh, to Texas with the news of freedom. Another is that the news was deliberately withheld by the enslavers to maintain the labor force on the plantations, that they just simply lied to the enslaved. Now, if you understand uh, American history well, you know that Nobody understood better what was going on than the enslaved. They, they heard about the news. They watched avidly. They watched. They, they got information when they could because this had to do and concerned with their own freedom and liberation. So you betcha they were watching and finding out what was going on. So that doesn't work. And still another is that federal troops actually waited for the slave owners to reap the benefits of one last cotton harvest before going to Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation that in other words, there was some money behind this and that it was in the interest of people to let this go a little further. All of these versions are myths and neither of these versions could be true. Uh, certainly for some, President Lincoln's authority over the rebellious states was in question uh, from the very beginning, but for whatever the reasons, conditions in Texas remain status quo well beyond what was statutory. And the thing is, when, when we're talking about Texas in particular, because remember folks that Texas was once Mexico, Texas is a different kind of state than New York or than may say Massachusetts or New England and other places who, uh, who also certainly once belonged to uh, other hands and other people. Uh, this was a whole other country for a very long time and only therefore part of the United States for a less, a period of time. Um, they had to be liberated at Bayonet Point uh, by Granger and his troops who issued an order asserting the Union Army's authority over the state of Texas based on the authority of the Emancipation Proclamation written a full two and a half years earlier. Here is the point where that Emancipation Proclamation, the much maligned Emancipation Proclamation that, that some, not all, but some people point out the weaknesses of it and therefore take credit away from Abraham Lincoln is where it kicked in. And it kicked in uh, uh, with real brute force and one that freed and finally ended slavery in America. It wasn't ended with the Emancipation Proclamation nor was it ever supposed to be per se. It freed a lot of people, however, by freedom of the foot, freedom to move, freedom to, to act, freedom to liberate oneself. Um, it's not necessarily a legal freedom, 
but it does legally free people in states that were against the union. The problem, of course, with that is that Lincoln has no jurisdiction in the Confederate States of America. That would be like the United States trying to pass a law in Canada, uh, which we cannot do that, <laughs> or Canada trying to pass a law here. You can't pass a law in another country, but in times of war is a whole different question. Because remember also that Lincoln and the Union, I should say, was losing the Civil War. Um, uh, the war was going quite badly for the, for the, for the Union. Uh, they had not won many victories. Uh, Lincoln is writing to, his, to General McClendon and saying, please do something. Um, I, I asked you to do this, I asked you to do that, and you haven't done anything. Um, you know, where, where do we stay? So the Union was getting rolled back. Britain came very close to recognizing the Confederate States of America. The state of New York passes a resolution in Albany recognizing the Confederacy in a resolution, the importance of it, because it was tied to the economy and tied to cotton. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to that. But uh, 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 Juneteenth uh, is also key to understanding the new Jim Crow and where we stand today, forcing us to rethink the periodization of the end of slavery, right? Uh, and the fact that there has never been a clear date for the ending of slavery. But finally, this comes probably the closest to doing so. Now, I have this slide up and I wanna make use of some of this information. To understand this backstory, we have to understand some complex history somewhat, which I'm gonna to try to go through very quickly. Um, you have increased racism and violence between 1830 and 1860. Um, there's a growing abolitionist militancy. Uh, there's different versions of abolitionism. Some people said abolition, uh, that slavery was a sin and that it was an evil uh, thing. Others, still others say, uh, well, we cannot imagine a, a world in which black and white live together. So we must, we must do something else. We may have to move black people to some other place. Uh, and, and that was known as uh, colonization or, or removal, uh, essentially. That does come about into the result uh, the resulting uh, country of Liberia, that project actually is, uh, does, does follow through. During the American Revolution, uh, enslaved were promised their freedom and many were moved by the British to Nova Scotia and other places. So that actually does happen. Um, uh, some people said, well, it must be, it has to be a Caribbean island or maybe Central America. Nobody was sure, but nobody could really envision a country in which black and white live together, what they call a biracial democracy. Not biracial as in mixed, but biracial as in black and white. Behind this whole thing is this is something that's very difficult to talk about, which is manifest destiny. It's a very American idea, one that people take uh, pride in. Uh, and that is basically uh, the, the, the idea of America moving from sea to shining sea. Remember, America only started out with 13 colonies. The west coast of America was the Mississippi River for a long time. Eventually, Ohio comes in as a territory and applies for statehood. Other territories apply for statehood. It has to do with the movement of mostly Europeans, uh, uh, but also some uh, uh, African-Americans and other groups that are moving west and moving into what was then really Native American territory. Um, it was their land, they lived there. And uh, uh, as uh, Europeans, essentially, mostly, uh, begin moving to these lands, they, there's war, there is a kind of, uh, I'm trying to put this as nicely as I can, uh, but territorial expansion that, that is done so, not in a nice way all the time, but also through treaties and through purchases that were somewhat, one could say were, you know, I guess legal in some ways. It's a mix of both, both things, of course. Uh, it's not just one or the other. The other thing is that uh, Native Americans lacked the immunities uh, to many of the diseases that Europeans uh, had and brought with them. And uh, people died by the score uh, just from that alone. Um, uh, one of the issues that we talk about when we talk about slavery is the fact that even though Europeans had been separated from indigenous, from Native Americans by a continent, uh, Europe and Africa are, are much closer and indeed, Europeans had been trading on the west coast of Africa. There's slave castles 
uh, on the west coast of Ghana and other places, Dakar and, and, uh, and, and other, other, other areas uh, that are European. Europeans built castles. Africans didn't do that so much. So those castles are evidence of the fact that Europeans had been there. They were exchanging goods. They are exchanging slaves. A slave trade is going to begin. But the other thing that they're exchanging is antibodies. And, and so uh, there's a, there used to be a terrific show that came on guns, uh, germs, and steel that explained some of that stuff. They exchanged antibodies and therefore Europeans and Africans actually shared the immunity to some of the diseases. Uh, remember that uh, when Europeans first come to the America, they tried to enslave the Native Americans first. That did not work because Native Americans knew the land, they knew where to hide, they knew how to, they, it was their land. This land, land is your land, this land is my land. It was their land. Uh, but they also um, uh, uh, couldn't, this was impossibility because of that shared immunity, uh, because of that lack of shared immunity. Um, this is going to become a point in warfare. Jeffrey Amherst in Massachusetts uh, is going to use that, uh, for instance, to uh, he had smallpox and blankets that were given to Native Americans and they died by the score. So so this is our history. It's not pretty all the time, but this is it. And what it did was it's not so much racism that they turned to Africans, but it was a practicality and one that was possible because Africans and Europeans had already been living together and exchanging these antibodies and germs. And therefore it made them in this very terrible, terrible, yeah. just, I mean, awful way, candidates for the possibility of this thing called enslavement. Now later is where the racism and the biblical justifications and the hatred and everything comes in. Largely speaking, it's not it's not an airtight thing, one of the others, but but there's a there's there's more of that. Which came first, slavery or racism? It's actually slavery. And because slavery was so profitable, it became profitable to add the racism, if you understand my meaning. But again, I digress. Uh, this idea of manifest destiny, uh, legitimized war for territorial expansion, defined progress in racial terms. A key part of understanding this is the idea of white supremacy or the notion that white people are a superior race, which is a belief system that, that many disagree with, but one that is, has been around for a long time and continues to even today. There's a scientific justification. Uh, these, 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 you know, people who were the subjects here of this, these poor souls who are at the mercy of all of this, the weight of science, the weight of nativism, the weight of the, the extermination of Indians, all of these different things um, make it very difficult to stop uh, what's known as white settler colonialism, which is the idea, is really what Manifest Destiny is. White people moving in wagon trails uh, and all of these different things out into these territories. It was known as the territories, setting up their settlement, getting more colonists and more people to come, and settle, uh, and then eventually applying for statehood. And this is the um, this is a map uh, of the southern slave states in 1860. Um, cotton, as you can see this diagram in the middle, cotton was king. It proves to be a very profitable crop, and it's even more profitable when you don't have to pay if you're not paying the people who are who are picking that crop uh, anything. Uh, so this is an exploitative labor system, one that goes against true nature of capitalism or free labor. Um, it's a shortcut and it's a cheat. It's a cheat on the backs of those who had to do the work, but it's a way for the state to become very rich very quickly. And it's a way for the United States to become very rich very quickly. If you've ever wondered uh, why we're often, we often hear America is one of the youngest countries in the world, but it's also became one of the richest countries in the world faster than any other place. Well, I submit to you, good people, that is because of this anti-American, this anti-humanistic idea called enslavement and slavery, where you can force people to do the work without giving them anything, uh, except blankets or cabin and that kind of thing. Um, okay, the opposite idea of that is called is called free labor, uh, which sounds kind of uh, that kind of goes doesn't go together. But free labor or free soil, the free soil movement, where uh, people who were hard workers and said that uh, believed in labor, that people ought to be paid a wage for the work that they do, uh, whether they're black or white or Native American or whatever, 
uh, that they ought to be paid and compensated. That's American idealism. That's what we most of us believe in. Um, and unfortunately, in these states, they took the shortcut that begins to create this unequal situation. Uh, slavery could have been ended if, if, after the American Revolution. That would have been the perfect time to do so. Uh, but these states hold out and make the argument that this is their Southern way of life and stuff. But actually, the, the profits were just so uh, big and would have to call that avarice, which is a word that means greed. Uh, these are the two, uh, this is a map showing the growing kind of, you know, again, I like to show maps uh, whenever I can. Um, this shows the election of 1860 and it shows the sort of the two sides uh, in question, but you can see in these areas, the territories, unorganized territory, Kansas territory, Nebraska, New Mexico, um, uh, at that time and uh, at that point. Now, as I mentioned, the Civil War ended in April of 1865. We learned this, every school uh, child knows this, uh, ended in April of 1865 when Robert E. Lee surrendered the Co Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to Union General Ulysses S. Grant. It happened at the Appomattox Courthouse, and this is a rendering of that. General Lee, some consider to be a very genteel and sort of gentlemanly sort of person, uh, gave up the, the cause and said, we lost, um, and signed over, which was, there was, there is something to be said for that. Uh, these people in Texas, however, were not gentlemanly in that sense. They did not recognize this agreement and they basically were doing kind of their own, their own thing. Um, now I wanted to show this picture. This is important to understand that this is at a time, uh, remember uh, uh, good folks that in the 19th century and early 20th century, um, people that are considered to be white today were, were not necessarily considered white yet. And that included people like the Irish, uh, and especially Irish Catholics and Catholics in general. Uh, remember, there was this nativist movement. Before we use the term Native American to describe, to describe Indians, the term Native American was used to describe people who were part of the Know Nothing Party. Uh, they were nativists, in fact, they called themselves Native Americans, that this was their land, in fact. Uh, and they identified more with the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, lineage. If anyone's ever seen the movie Gangs of New York, uh, uh, the guy who's, you know, the Bill, uh, Bill the Butcher, uh, he was an example of that nativist sentiment. And remember, he hated, he, he looked down upon the Irish and all that kind of thing. Um, this is a cartoon uh, commenting on the desegregation of streetcars in Washington, D.C. The black woman on the right is depicted as a lady of beauty, refinement, and wealth. On the left, the Irish American woman is stereotyped with ape like features and working class attire, a servant or housewife. Mrs. McCafferty has been to the market to purchase fresh produce and fish. Her basket also holds two bottles of alcohol, frequently associated with Irish Catholics. You know, they have that problem. That's the kind of stereotyping and discrimination that, that was occurring at that time. White people who were not, that we considered white, it's not the African-American who's depicted with ape-like features, it's the Irish-American depicted with ape-like features. Um, other groups, Italians were not necessarily quite considered to be fully white. There was question about Jews, even though that's a, a religious designation, but European uh, ethnics and so on, they were not considered to be white. If you didn't come over on the Mayflower um, uh, and could prove your lineage back to that, then you were not necessarily considered to be fully white. There's a great book about this called How the Irish Became White by Noel Ignatiev. There's other books like that, uh, How Jews Became uh, White Folks and What That Means, I believe is the name of that. And so, so, so there's, there's a piece, that's an important piece to understand here that, 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 that becomes uh, important later. I'd like to turn for a moment to talk a, a little bit about the Northeast. Um, remember that um, even though slavery, even though Juneteenth has been talked about uh, so far, uh, it's also important to remember that 
earlier, the, uh, originally the uh, 13 colonies, the, the, uh, the Northeast or, the, or New England states were the original ones to end slavery. Uh, Vermont ended slavery in 1777. Massachusetts ends slavery in 1783. Um, and so on and so forth. Pennsylvania, uh, or Washington, DC. Um, what that means is that the people there celebrated emancipation a lot earlier and in different, in different ways and in all different days. Um, and if you permit me, I'd just like to share a little bit of that with you. Um, so although we say that Juneteenth is the oldest, it's important to remember that prior to December, Vermont, as I mentioned, Pennsylvania, 1781, many of these states have enacted an emancipation day uh, uh, on the day that they set emancipation, because this was done much earlier than Juneteenth, um, uh, in which they celebrate. The state of Texas, obviously June 19th, but Florida celebrates its emancipation day on May 20th. Mississippi celebrates its emancipation day on May the 8th. Washington DC enacted such a law in 2007, which gave its citizens a day to celebrate being April the 16th. And I'd like to share with you that there's all different ways that people are freed and uh, emancipated. Uh, some were done by law, some was done by the state constitutions. Um, the city of Washington DC, however, did something which is known as compensated emancipation. Um, and they celebrate that day Compensated Emancipation Act, which abolished slavery in the nation's capital in 1862, the act signed into law by President Lincoln during the American Civil War paid DC slave owners up to $300 to give up their slaves and ultimately freed more than 3,000 slaves according to the US Senate website. The reason the US Senate has those numbers is because it was your tax dollars, my tax dollars, well not us, but those who came before us, their tax dollars, which actually was used to compensate owners for their slaves. Remember everybody, when we say that uh, people as property, that is not a metaphor. This is a literal thing. And, and, and the enslaved, although it is a uh, absurd thing to, to even vocalize, all had different prices and values and could be quite uh, expensive. If we use that term, it could be worth quite a lot of money. Uh, a lot of black folk had to figure out how much they were worth uh, so that they could buy themselves out of freedom. So they could buy mom out of, or they could buy each other out, their family members out, their loved ones out of freedom. And you have to know how much someone is worth in order to do that. Um, and so there's no shame in that. It's just part, it's a very ugly part, but it's part of our history. But uh, DC slave owners paid up to $300 to give up their slaves and ultimately freed more than 3,000. Uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, people celebrated for a long time uh, the word of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. It's one of the reasons also that many black churches in Long Island, in Massachusetts, all throughout the, in fact, throughout the country, uh, have something called Watch Night. Watch Nights, uh, the AME Church does, uh, where um, on uh, New Year's Eve, Oops. On New Year's Eve, they stay up waiting for the watch, waiting uh, uh, at, you know, to, to, for the midnight to pass, because that was traditionally for many people the day that emancipation uh, was celebrated. Um, when word reached Tremont Temple in Boston, the crowd exploded into jubilation as Douglas led the singing of his favorite spiritual, blow ye the trumpet blow. Um, the occasion... Uh, uh, and, and Lincoln described, uh, excuse me, Douglas describes this occasion. The occasion wherefore was one of both hope and fear, whether we should survive or perish depended in large measure upon the coming of this proclamation. We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, which should rend the fetters of four millions of slaves. We were watching as it were by the dim lights of the stars for the dawn of a new day. We were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. And so we want to honor that. Juneteenth 
comprises all of these celebrations. But I want everybody to know that for a lot of people, Emancipation Day is not something new for Black people have been celebrating Emancipation Day for a very long time. And usually it's on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. But as I read to you, every state has a different one. Now, I'd, <laughs> this slide that you, that's been sitting here that you're watching, uh, uh, maybe some of you have already deduced what this is talking about. But if you notice uh, these, uh, this is a, a percent, blacks as percentage as a percentage of the entire population uh, in, this, in these years. Notice that, uh, as I said, Vermont gets credit for being the first state in the country to abolish slavery, but there were very few black people in Vermont. <laughs> and uh, to this day, that I believe is still the case. Uh, uh, Massachusetts deserves credit for ending slavery, I, I joke but obviously deserve credit for ending slavery, being the first. But you see folks, the numbers are quite low uh, in those places, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, uh, very low. In fact, Rhode Island, little Rhode Island, actually edging up there though, um, uh, Connecticut, quite low. But then here, look at the black one. And here is New York. It's the highest out of all of the Northeast spaces. And I want you to know, good people, that uh, New York is one of the last states to end slavery in the Northeast. And there's a reason for that. And the reason has to do with this somewhat high number of, in, of, black, of black people that lived in New York, in uh, uh, New Amsterdam, and, and so on. Um, slavery is not ended in New York until July 4th, 1827, which is... Uh, is pretty late when you stop and think about it. Um, you know that there is an African burial ground in Wall Street uh, in, in the city. And some of the people who, uh, who are resting there to, the, to their eternity uh, were the people in the hands and the bodies that built Wall Street. They built the wall after which Wall Street is named, but because of their toil and their labor, they built, uh, symbolically what Wall Street represents, which is the economic center of the entire world. The economic center of the world, this is the empire state, uh, which drove capitalism and still does, I believe, Wall Street, everybody. And so you see, you see you've got to understand and we've got to start understanding the role and the contribution that black people have made, not only in this country, but locally here in New York, and so on and so forth. And that has to be honored a little bit better. But what I'm trying to say is that it was somewhat easier to end slavery in places that had few, uh, play, uh, few slaves because the economic investment was not as great. And so while they deserve credit, certainly it's a noble gesture. Uh, it wasn't that hard to end slavery in Massachusetts or New England, which really just had small farms with, with very few enslaved people, not very, you know, some, with some minor exceptions, but for the most part, uh, and you also have indentured servitude, which needs to be said, uh, uh, the Irish, the Scottish, uh, some of these other groups who, who were white and also uh, were part of that. But uh, uh, also New England and New York, we have very harsh winters. Um, it was expensive to have slavery because you had to provide a little bit more in the Southern colonies and Southern states, it's a more temperate climate. It's a more tropical climate uh, year round. There's not as much shelter. There's not blankets, coats, et cetera, these things. And look, and you see the number in South Carolina is just shooting straight up. Um, uh, so, 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 so those of you who have, you know, who, for those of us who like to think for ourselves, you can see that uh, uh, why things happen. There is, there is a method to the madness, if you will. I just wanted to also point out that uh, when slavery was abolished in New York um, and, and therefore people have celebrated Emancipation Day in New York and are still doing so now, which is called Abolition Day on July 4th uh, and in the month of July, uh, but on the, on the celebration of the abolition of slavery in the state of New York, Nathaniel Paul, who was a, a pastor, uh, gave a rousing address uh, and talked to the people about what it meant. He stated, we look forward with pleasing anticipation to that period when it shall no longer be said that in a land of free men, there are men in bondage. 
but when this foul stain will be entirely erased and this worst of evils will be forever done away. And it's, it's, it's quite uh, lengthy and I invite you to, uh, to, to check that out. Uh, 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 that can be found. So watch night, uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Nathaniel Paul's address and, and, and also a little bit more closer to home in Long Island, uh, people had been celebrating something called Pinkster. Pinkster, which is um, a holiday uh, uh, just as valid and just as worthy in its own time as Juneteenth is today. Uh, originally, the Pinkster holiday was the Dutch celebrating Pentecost for many generations. It was celebrated primarily by African-Americans from Albany to Long Island and seems to reflect the African style festival of parades and masquerades. People were able to bring their wares and their crafts and their uh, uh, different things to sell in, in New York. Uh, uh, and people were still keeping this holiday alive as, as late as the 1840s. Uh, for many days before it arrives, African-Americans came to the city of New York with their sassafras and single toe for sale in order to raise money, which they got to keep. Um, and they were given three days off for the Pinkster holidays. So if anybody's looking for something that has to do with Long Island, Pinkster is something I urge everybody to check out. Remember that uh, even though we think of Long Island as being a very monolithic place, Black people and Native American people, well, the Native American people were there originally, uh, and Black people have been there for a mighty, mighty long time as well. Uh, Long Island businessmen would gather up items they could sell, such as roots, berries, herbs, birds, fish, clams, and oysters, and bring them to the Catherine Market in New York City. Uh, progress came uh, as a result, in eight, even before uh, emancipation, and, and I'm going to move on, but in 1815, I want you to note that seven Black property owners were registered in Bellport, East Hampton, Mastic, Greenport, Eastville, Westbury, Success. Smithville, Jamaica, Newtown, and Weeksville in Brooklyn. And, and, this, and it goes on and on. Um, and so getting back, property. getting yeah. back to our topic and, and kind of coming, coming to, the, to, to, to starting to move toward conclusion. Uh, another important thing we've got to talk about is the war with Mexico. Um, uh, as I said, America grows through this territorial expansion. And, and some of it in the case of the American Southwest was due to the war with Mexico, also known as the Mexican-American War uh, between 1846 and 1848. What America's genius has been is the system of checks and balances. And I guess you could call it compromise. Um, for many years, there was this kind of seesaw effect with the addition of slave states and the addition of free states coming into the union. And people wanted to keep that on par with each other because eventually uh, either side, I suppose, didn't want to lose uh, the power that they had. We really became a nation divided uh, essentially right after the American Revolution. That would have been the time to end the slavery discussion once and for all. Uh, Jefferson, I'll talk about if, I, if there's time, tried to do just that, but uh, it didn't, didn't work out as we already said. But the war with Mexico, uh, is an important part of this. Manifest Destiny described and detailed and shown here, illustrated as this beautiful angel sort of moving across the prairie land. And these are the myths that we hear and learn about as you can see the people hardworking and so on. But the truth is a much bloodier one. It's a much more difficult expansion and, and, and it leads to sectional conflict. Uh, sectional conflict with Mexico in this case, because America wanted it uh, and uh, was going to move ahead in, in taking it. This, the war was the ultimate extension of Manifest Destiny. It's the thing that, that makes, makes it to the Pacific. Uh, before that, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a slow moving proposition. Um, uh, the belief that Americans had a God-given destiny though, to take over the entire North American continent. That is the idea of manifest destiny. That's also an important thing. There was a guy, David Wilmot, a Congressman from Pennsylvania who said, hey, wait a second. Uh, okay, fine, uh, but, but, but there shouldn't be slavery in these, any lands that come out of this war. That would be uh, disastrous. And as you can read, and I'm gonna read it very quickly if I can. Uh, oops, provided territory 
something blocking, so I can't totally see it. Conditions the acquisition of any of the Republic of Mexico by the United States by virtue of any treaty which may be negotiated between them and to the use by the executive of the monies here and appropriated, neither slavery, listen up, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of said territory except for crime whereof the party shall be first duly convicted. Now that has a familiar ring to it uh, uh, in addition to what this is about, but also that's the same language that's going to be used in the 13th Amendment that uh, a lot of people have pointed to the fact that that's, that was a loophole. Um, but, but so that, that's something to note as well, that this language, that's a different lecture, but that language from the 13th Amendment is uh, something that had already been around uh, as well. Needless to say, he did not get that. Um, Ohio Senator Tom Corwin accused President Polk of involving the United States in a war of aggression. Uh, you have all kinds of different perspectives. Massachusetts Sen Senator Daniel Webster voiced doubts about the constitutionality of Polk's actions, believing Polk had failed to consult adequately with Congress. Remember, Henry David Thoreau uh, refused to pay his Massachusetts poll tax because he believed the war to be an immoral war. And so there's all kinds of discussion about that, but it was a freshman Whig congressman from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, who questioned whether the spot where blood had been shed was really US soil at all. And so this is a major debate uh, that goes on. But again, you can see it's this art of compromise that begins to move forward. The Missouri Compromise, 1820, Missouri comes into the state, uh, to the union, and with the state of Maine, which had previously been part of Massachusetts, they carved out Massachusetts. Why? Just to keep the, the uh, parity between the number of slave states and free states, but to move, move forward. Uh, Northerners were opposed to Missouri's entry as a slave state. There was a storm of protest in the North. Um, and this really, uh, uh, again, kind of uh, results in the Missouri Compromise, which contained a clause which forever prohibited slavery north of the 3630 parallel in all the territory acquired from France by the Louisiana Purchase. Remember all of these things we learned? Um, for kids and for young people who might be on here, uh, Louisiana, the territory is much bigger <laughs> than just the state of Louisiana. I don't know if I have that map right now, but as you can see, Missouri, this, there's Missouri here, the state, and then there's the Missouri Territory, which is very large, Arkansas Territory and so on. Uh, all of this part was Mexico. And so uh, uh, then gold is discovered in California and that made an even bigger prospect. But you can see here with each state, 1803, comes in, Ohio, the first, comes in as a free state. Louisiana comes in as a slave state in 1812, 1816. Uh, Indiana comes in as a free state. Um, Mississippi, and see the seesaw effect that continues on. Um, uh, Illinois, Alabama, 11 at 12, at 12 in 1821. 1837, you have 13 on both sides. By 1845, in Texas and Florida, um, there's a few more slave states. And then the Cascade, Iowa, Wisconsin, California, Minnesota, Oregon, Kansas, all coming in as free states. The South claims to be the victims of this. And they say, we are outnumbered. Now there's uh, more uh, uh, free states than slave states. Uh, well, what, what does that mean? Remember that every state gets two senators, whether it's big Texas or tiny Rhode Island but every state has a different representation in the, in the House or Congress, the House of Representatives, which is counted by population. Um, and uh, the Southern states like South Carolina, who was the state is majority uh, enslaved people, they said, hey, that's not fair. Um, you know, uh, we're outnumbered. We don't have as much representation because we have very few Europeans in, in South Carolina very few white property owning uh, uh, males, which remember that was, were the only people who could vote and usually at this time could, you know, would be running for office and that kind of thing. And so they said, uh, you know, would it be possible for us to count our enslaved? And uh, that is known as the three-fifths compromise. Again, another compromise. 
uh, in the Constitution. They said, okay, well, you can count three out of every enslaved. It would count. Uh, how about that? And they said, we'll take it. Um, and so what is all of this, and, 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 and it's a terrible idea because it, it, it hurt, it's a very hurtful one as well, because a lot of people said, am I three-fifths of a person? Is that what, what that means to say? Um, and it's also very unfair because it, uh, it gave the slave power this extra advantage, um, uh, one which is going to lead us straight to civil war. Um, now, going back again to Jefferson, Jefferson wrote to a friend uh, after he basically lost that fight in order to end, you know, in, in order to get that part uh, into the Declaration of Independence. He said, uh, this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a market principle, and I was gonna jump to the end. Uh, he compares it to holding a wolf by the ears. We can neither hold him nor safely let him go. And Jefferson, very interesting figure, one who had issues, uh, but a very interesting individual uh, to be certain. Um, I talked already about this, the ACS, another, other ideas of how to solve the slavery problem. Meanwhile, the, the more uh, recognizable abolitionist movement is growing. People like Frederick Douglass who are coming to the forefront to tell their story. Frederick Douglass spoke so well and so articulately that people said this person could never have been a slave. They didn't, they doubted his story and they didn't, didn't believe it. Uh, but genius can pop up anywhere. And this gives you sort of a quick and dirty abolitionist history in the North, uh, the New York Anti-Slavery Society and some of the New York concerns involved. Uh, we talked about this already, a map showing all of the, the years. Uh, Sojourner Truth is someone that people should know about. She was from New York and John Brown. Um, oh, sorry. And so the anti-slavery movement, as it grows, um, it begins to uh, really fight against this idea, uh, the slave power and fight for the idea that this was a sinful uh, system. They couch it in good terms of good and evil, uh, not unlike abolitionists even today who are talking about some of the systems and things that are happening in the world as good and evil. They saw it that way. Uh, and we're not afraid to call it out as such. Uh, you have the Black Convention Movement, very important uh, as, as, as Black men, especially who come to the forefront as leaders. Uh, I talked, we talked again, coming back in, to, to full circle, the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, this is a, you can see a picture of it. Um, the civil, the, the Antietam battle gave Lincoln the victory he needed in order to do what was essentially this ingenious military strategy. Um, he, he had been, they had been pushing him to write an Emancipation Proclamation. Should he do it? Should he not do it? Um, and so it's not so much a question of whether Lincoln was the great emancipator. He was a military strategist of the highest order. And his idea was to keep the union together. He basically says that. He says, if I have to free all the slaves, keep the union together, I'd do that. If I got to free some of the slaves to do it, I'll do that. If I got to free none of the slaves, I'll do whatever it takes to keep the union together was, was really his major thing. And I think that's something we should all probably be thankful for because had it not been for uh, that, that being Lincoln realizing that black people needed to get involved in order to change the, uh, change the course of the war, which is what happened. It also means that we should be shaking the hand of every black person we, you've ever seen and thanking them for helping to make sure that this country stayed free and stayed one without slavery, one that is united and together. Uh, we are still fighting that battle today. I think as you probably have noticed, if you turn on the news uh, and, 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 and actually all the symbols are there, the Confederate flag uh, uh, in the halls of, you know, uh, in the, uh, the insurrection, people wrapped in it. All of those things mean something. So, we must understand this history. It's very important. And this is the, probably the best legacy of Juneteenth. It helps us to, we got to first know the history. It helps us to recognize the importance of history and realizing that there are places in the South right now 
where it has become illegal to teach this history. And so it doesn't take a big jump to understand why, right? Uh, 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 this history is a very important thing to know, but if we can prevent people from ever finding out about how we got to this point in the first place, uh, then uh, it might be very easy to do all kinds of other things. Um, and so it's complicated, but it's really worth uh, learning and finding out about. Um, as I mentioned, this, just to clear this up, Emancipation Proclamation, it freed very few people in the end, but, it, but in the end, it's the thing that ends up freeing uh, those, those souls uh, that were still enslaved in, in Galveston, um, Texas. And uh, it was black soldiers the Massachusetts 54 black soldiers. And by 1865, black soldiers, some of whom were also from Massachusetts, the Massachusetts 55th Regiment and a few others who are with General Gordon Granger when they go at bayonet point uh, with rifles in hand and uh, 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 the buckshot loaded in those rifles and ready to fire, ready to make the point that you must cease and desist. The war is over. And uh, your attempt to keep people enslaved in bondage uh, is not going to work. And that is really, really what Juneteenth is. Uh, if people start, because if anyone asks you, tell them that. Tell them that it was their example that, that freed those people and therefore freed us all and created the kind of freedom that we need. Now, the problem is, of course, you know, you have, you have things like this, uh, which also happened, which was the uh, 40 acres and a mule promise, which was broken. There are people today who are asking for reparations and people say, why? You don't deserve that. Know your history. Know that a special field order was given, special field order 15 by General Sherman, who was, a, I think, a pretty big name uh, that comes out of that struggle. He issued that special field order and he told them, you will have 40 acres and a mule to each freed slave. It's a promise that was broken and it's one of the biggest broken promises in American history. Uh, people ought to be made whole as a result of it. Um, and so just wrapping up here, um, uh, uh, today uh, you ought to know, you need to know that, um, I'm just gonna move on to the end. I had a couple other things here. The Civil War, bloodiest, one of the bloodiest wars on record. Uh, look at the numbers. It rivaled World War II, Vietnam, Korean, the Korean War, Mexican, the Mexican-American War, which we talked about, Revolutionary War, uh, combined had uh, way more deaths and casualties. Um, this was the, uh, the rending of uh, a long-standing problem of this issue not being solved around slavery. Um, and uh, uh, people Today in the South, they call, they don't call it the Civil War. Sometimes they call it the War of Northern Aggression, right? They call it the Lost Cause. It's the same spirit that those Confederates in Texas had. They, they were in denial about the fact that they lost the war. And uh, uh, we've seen that also recently with people being in denial that they've lost an election or that they've lost something else. Uh, they've lost that connection. This is, this, is, this, is, this is something we must disrupt. And when you make it illegal to teach this information, you make it illegal to talk about it. The laws that are on the books today for critical race theory literally say it's illegal to teach history that makes people feel uncomfortable. And where does that leave us, people? That leaves us in a big fog of misunderstanding. Um, when you start to legislate what people can read and you start banning books like they're they've been doing and saying that people who are writing books like the 1619, those books should be banned or my colleague, my good friend, Ibram Kendi's book uh, that it needs to be banned. Um, there was other societies that banned books. There were other societies that banned what you could read and learn and study about. Uh, most of them were in uh, Europe and Spain and Germany and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and Italy. And I'll let people draw their own conclusions about that. Uh, but closer to home, uh, that same kind of terror tactics, the Ku Klux Klan, all of these things, we need to challenge this. So here's something I wanted to show. Uh, and I see I'm almost about at eight. 
uh, the slave market in New York Harbor. Remember that there was slavery in New York. Remember that it enforces and informs everything that we do. And when you see uh, people, uh, black communities in New York and in Long Island, that people have been through a mighty, mighty struggle. Um, uh, because New York's the economic capital of the country, it benefited greatly from slavery. And it's not just from the enslavement, but who makes the rope? Who makes the ships? Who makes the wood that you see in these, you know, who, who writes the insurance policies? Uh, a lot of these companies are still in existence that benefited uh, mightily from the money that just poured out of slavery. It was a very profitable institution. Um, and they were very loath to, uh, to let it go or to let it die. We hold these truths to be self-evident, says the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal. This precept alone was something that Jefferson tried to bring about, but it's not until black folks pushing for their rights, fighting for their rights, for their own liberation, help America actually reach its own stated ideals. We've never had this. So next time people say, oh, well, we don't want LGBTQ. We don't want African-Americans getting their rights. We don't want other groups, women and other people fighting for the rights. It's those groups that have helped make America what it is today, a more democratic place and live up to its own stated ideals. Isn't that a good thing? If you love this country, then that should be something that we all cherish and embrace. We need that diversity. That's what made, that's what's making things work today. This kind of thing, you know, unfortunately, the, the things like the invention of the cotton gin, this, this, this made slavery very profitable. And this is the reason why it went on way longer than it should have. Uh, I talked about the black churches in Long Island. Visit one, find out about some of the history. And I just wanna conclude. I want you to know that on January 1st, 1980, Juneteenth became an official state holiday. Um, New York just passed this the state holiday a couple of years ago, and now it's a federal holiday as we know. But I want you to know that way back in 1980 is when Texas made Juneteenth their official state holiday. Uh, there was a guy there named Al Edwards, uh, African-American state legislator who, who pushed hard. And, and, and those families, the, from the original ones who were freed on June 19th the, and their descendants for many generations kept celebrating that moment. They said there's something, there was something special about that, not just because it was late and not because the word got there late, but because they were the hostages to fortune that were the holdouts that, uh, whose patience and whose, whose strength uh, speaks to the strength of this country. And so, so that's why Juneteenth is a national holiday. This is not just a black holiday. This is a holiday that we all should be embracing. It's just as important on par with July 4th. And I wanna be clear, African-Americans have always celebrated July 4th and none more fervently uh, and, and other groups as well, because if you really love this country, you'd be willing to fight for it to be a better place, not one that is about inequality and going backwards or exploitative uh, where you are reaping the benefits, in this case, the riches from the work that's been done literally on the backs of other people, uh, but one in which we have a fairer place where we have unions, where we have labor and free labor, one uh, where people are given a, a, a fair wage. And so as you can see, there's a lot more stuff here that I wish I had time to go over, uh, but I will, uh, but that, that really is pretty much about it. Uh, the ways, ways people challenge slavery, the way they pushed back, ingenious things like creating quilts that told of how to, to navigate and how to escape. Um, uh, you know, when you go and basically steal, like take a whole bunch of people, you don't know who you're getting. You're getting geniuses, you're getting uh, brilliant minds, you're getting everything. You're getting African chiefs and princes and, and all kinds of stuff uh, because genius can pop up anywhere and people uh, figured, figured things out. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much about it. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for hanging in there um, with this. And you see uh, uh, basically what that brings us to today. Um, I wanted to mention this wonderful book called On Juneteenth uh, by Annette Gordon-Reed, which I, uh, I think the library probably has this. And it's a wonderful uh, book. It's a, and it's a short book that explains very well 
uh, this sort of interpretation that I'm sharing with you about reconstruction, uh, about Juneteenth Civil War and reconstruction and how we got uh, to the place that we are basically at today. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Malifi. I'd like to open the floor up for anyone that has questions that didn't, I don't know if the question in the chat was answered. Was that, I feel like you did touch upon that. Oh, I um, hadn't seen the chat. Uh, I hadn't had a chance to, when I, I couldn't see it. Um, Oh, okay, I see the question now. Uh, and, and feel free uh, if anyone has any other questions uh, to put in, but I'll deal with this uh, first question. Um, how did the name Juneteenth come about? Why is this being recognized after all these centuries? Why isn't July 4th enough to remember our and Cap's history? Um, you know, I, I think, thank you for the question. It looks like Colleen is the name. Um, when you say our history, uh, that's, that's probably unclear to, to everybody of who, who's, who you're uh, referencing there. Um, uh, Juneteenth is a, is a combination of the month June and 19th. That's where the name comes about. And why is it being recognized after all this time? Um, it's being recognized after all this time because uh, this is a, a story that has been obscured and one that, that not enough people knew about. Um, and it was it was on the part of the people of Texas who kept pushing and kept saying, you know, this story matters. It's very, very important one. Um, uh, they knew about it. It's just that 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 not all Americans have known about it. Um, and, 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 and honestly, based on the history that I shared with you, uh, what you see is this gradual process of emancipating some people at a little at a time. Uh, a few people were freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, very few uh, legally freed um, uh, on the South Carolina Sea Islands. Uh, other people voted with their feet. They threw down their tools. They threw down that stuff and walked away from those plantations and freed themselves, right? Because Lincoln knew that uh, with the support of the Union Army, uh, that the enslaved would feel that support and be able to do what they had to do. And that's exactly what happens. And they move toward the union lines and say, I'd like to sign up. Um, that turned the course of the war. So what you have to understand, Colleen, is that uh, America might be called the Confederate States of America today had it not been for those uh, uh, folks who, um, who voted with their feet. Then the 13th Amendment comes along and abolishes slavery or makes the slavery uh, illegal, basically abolishes slavery, except it has that little line in there about people who, are, uh, who have committed a crime. And you probably already know that uh, we are the biggest jailer in the world. We have more prisons than any other country in the world. And the people that fill those prisons are people whose skin is black and brown. And that's not, that's not necessarily a coincidence. Um, uh, the numbers are staggering. I, I don't have time to go into all of them right now, but, uh, uh, and we also came up with a little thing in America called private prisons. We have private prison companies that's, that trade on the stock market and even other state prisons benefit all kinds of ways financially. If you know anybody who's ever been in prison, if you have to call them, you have to pay all kinds of fees and collect fees. And, uh, there's companies, there's umpteenth companies making a lot of money off of that. The, de the detention centers that were used uh, when uh, families were being locked up uh, during the Trump years, uh, those are all privately owned companies. And so uh, most of them. And so um, uh, there's all kinds of ways to make money still um, on the backs of other people and, and profit off of this uh, inequality. Um, uh, the book, there's a book I would recommend called The New Jim Crow. And it explains how when slavery ended, it really just becomes slavery of, of another name, with another name. Um, uh, the, the, instead of people being enslaved, they became sharecroppers. There was all kinds of ways to keep uh, people uh, on plantations. Uh, and, they, and they used the laws to, to basically 
the, and the part of the 13th Amendment that said you are still enslaved if you've committed a crime to be to put those people into jails. So today we have people warehoused in prisons uh, as a result of this. And my point is, is that this process of emancipation goes on today. We're still living it. And a lot of people are asking, are we free? Are we still are we free yet? Uh, uh, you've seen what happened with George Floyd and uh, uh, black kids a lot of times who are, you know, especially our boys and young men and women driving the wrong car in the wrong neighborhood, pulled over, shot and killed for no reason. The struggle goes on. The struggle goes on. And, and that's the point of Juneteenth. It's an ongoing process. You thought it was over in 1863. Nope. You thought it was over in 1865, not, not quite, uh, in April, not quite. June, it's still going on. December is ratified, and yet it still goes on today. And that is why we're celebrate, celebrating it centuries later, as you put. Thank you for that question. Okay, I see. Is there another? I think there's another question. There's another, another comment in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see, I uh, said, um, <clears throat> okay, JD says, you mentioned that Vermont and Massachusetts and others only had a few slaves, although they were first to pass freedom laws, but was it not positive that they were providing safe haven in passing those laws? Uh, absolutely, uh, of course it's positive. Um, they, uh, in many cases, abide by the spirit of the American Revolution. Remember that um, the, uh, uh, the American Revolution and the patriots who were fighting against England, they called themselves slaves. They said, we're slaves to Great Britain, um, that we're enslaved ourselves. And so the, uh, the spirit of the American Revolution was, was anti-slavery. It was anti-slavery. And then they go forward and actually, um, uh, some of them had to be uh, Massachusetts is there because they, they were sued by someone named Quack Walker, who was an enslaved person. They didn't do it willingly, though, J.D. Uh, it, it happens differently in every part. Um, but Massachusetts follows through and includes that spirit of freedom in its uh, in its state constitution. And in fact, it's that it's based on that state constitution that uh, that mum bet and then Quack Walker and, and a couple other lawsuits. They say we read the state constitution. <laughs> it seems pretty clear that uh, that uh, uh, we shouldn't be enslaved anymore, and um, and uh, it's on that basis that that finally abolition does happen. But it happens differently in each place, and that's the point that I've, I've been trying to make. But uh, I would absolutely say it was a positive thing, of course. Dr. Malinsky, is it okay to put your email in the chat for people if they have other questions for you, or is Absolutely. that? Oh, please um, do. Absolutely. Uh, I'm it's, paste, oh, you I'm have it there. Email. Yep, I just <laughs> had it yeah. at the ready. I figured if anyone else, you know, would like to um, open a dialogue with you, that they can um, by email because this is a very, you know, there's so much history there and so much on the topic. I feel that people may have questions even after they've digested everything that you've talked about, which, which was wonderful. Oh, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. And I, you know, I'm right up the road there. Uh, well, I'm vir we're virtual today, but uh, Stony Brook is not far away. You know, I think that um, uh, Long Island, it's a special place. It really is. Um, there's a lot that we can do. Um, I think that, you know, when newspapers, for instance, uh, say that, you know, Long Island is most one of the most segregated parts of America, which much to our shame and dismay it does say this, um, or that the school system is one of the most segregated in America. That should motivate people to wanna to do something about that. Because those of us who live in, and work, in my case in Long Island, know it's a very special place. And we don't want that stigma. We don't want that, that, that kind of way of, of, of it being seen. And, and so it's, even though it didn't start off like great, uh, it's not too late to, to try to fix it. It's not too late to try to make good on it. What would it say to the rest of the country if the place that's the most segregated is able to make some changes and turn it around? And so I thank all of you, uh, good people who are coming on. I, we, if you, you take my classes or you can ask my students, we don't censor any opinions 
or, or, or views, and, and it's completely open. Um, I love the chance to discuss with people because I know that the facts and the truth is on our side. And so don't let anybody tell you about uh, these alternative facts and alternative truth. Uh, you know what, what that's about. And so we stick with the stuff that we can talk about, the facts of, of history. So I thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time and your presentation. This was fantastic. And thank you for all the other libraries joining in. Um, I hope everyone, you know, enjoyed it as much as I did. And if anything, they, um, you know, the emails in the chat, please feel free. And we appreciate everyone showing. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Feel free to call upon me for anything, right? Not too far away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good night. Have, Have a, a great safe night, night everybody. Thank you. Thank you.